and welcome to my little mini workshop class on how you possibly hit your standards and your outcomes when you do an independent reading and reading workshop. Um, before we start though, I want to talk about what people have been telling me is their biggest problem when it comes to reading workshop and that's getting students to actually read. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to go into this in detail right now. I'm going to link to a blog, po blog post in this video. If you look underneath the video on YouTube, you'll find it there. Um, we need to, whether we like it or not, whether we think to or think we need to or not, is work on teaching students to focus and to build their stamina with reading. Because as you know, their focus is so pulled these days. And therefore, it's much more difficult to sit and read for a sustained amount of time. So what I used to do was use a timer and I discuss it with the students. We would pick like a minimum amount of reading time for the first day, even like some classes with a lot of reluctant readers. It might only be three minutes. Other classes, it might be five, whatever. And then you set the timer. When the timer goes, they can finish their page. The next day, you add another minute or another two minutes or another five minutes, whatever the case might be. Anyway, you can read more about that strategy and other strategies to help students to get them to focus to read in the blog post. That looks like this. Okay, so let's get to today's lesson. When you teach a full class text, whether it's a play or a novel, your roadmap is pretty clear. You know, you got to get from point A to point B and you go through the chapters, right? And it's pretty clear how you can keep everybody on task doing the activities for the book. But with independent reading, you're not teaching chapter one on Monday, two and three on Wednesday, and four on Friday, and whatever the case might be. It, the path is not linear or it doesn't appear to be linear. It feels a little bit more chaotic, but yet you still have to get your students to the same destination. How do you do that? I'm going to go through a strategy that I used. I perfected it over the perfected. I made it better over the years. Um, and it's one that you can use with any text, whether it's independent novels or even full class texts. With independent, independent reading, you have to focus on the skills and not the content and present those lessons and those skills in a clear, organized way. That's the, the hard part. You need to use strategies and activities that are gonna keep your students engaged because when you're doing a full class text, you might know like when I do Macbeth, for example, I've got this one activity that I know all the students are going to um, get involved with. But when they don't have that common text, it can be a little bit more difficult or maybe, maybe not. You also need a seamless plan to blend <clears throat> your writing instruction and your grammar when you're doing independent reading. So with my strategy, what I do is I target the skills, I model the skills using mentor texts, and then students get multiple opportunities to apply that skill with any text. Check, check, check each time. It's a strategy, like I said, that can work with independent novels. It will work when you're doing book clubs, and it will also work with full class novels. So in this little mini lesson, mini workshop, you're going to learn how you can teach skills when everybody has a different book. You're going to learn how to do that using short mentor texts. You're going to be able to ensure that your students are hitting the standards, even when they're reading different books. And you're gonna learn strategies to plan and manage the lessons to keep your students engaged and learning. So the first step, is to look at their outcome, the outcomes that your students need to achieve, your standards, and make a list of skills that they're going to need by the end of the semester or the year. And the best way to do that is to look at the final assessment. What is it my students are going to need to be successful for that one or for other assessments along the way? Then you need to make a plan for the best order to work on those skills. For me, I started with the basics and build my students up to more complex tasks. Number one tip, don't dive into literary analysis on the first day, um, maybe not even in the first or second week. You need to scaffold those skills and get your students interested and engaged first. I do that with a series of lessons on inferencing, and I start by using visuals because we all inference every day. 
by looking at people and figuring out how they're feeling based on <clears throat> either the tone of their voice or the set of their face or whatever the case might be. So I ease into inferences by using visuals and also some engaging collaborative activities like stations and some group writing assignments that show students that, yeah, you already do know how to make inferences. And then we make the transition into how do you make an inference on a text? Okay, you look at the clues the author is giving you, just like the look on your mother's face when she's about to explode, and your experiences about what happens when you see that look on your mother's face and a conclusion that you can make. So it's all very seamless. I also um, did this assignment where I would give students a scene that was stripped of any um, stage directions and they had to make inferences on it based on what the author was telling them and what they knew from their own experience. We discussed that and then I gave them, gave them the same scene with the um, stage directions there and they could see if they were correct. And then we could do some assignments where they change the stage directions to change what the meaning is in the scene. And they always really liked that one. We also early in the game did many, not many, several lessons on what it means to be an active reader and how and why you should annotate a text. We practice close reading so students were ready to go when we started reading. The first part of my term, I always do an introduction or review, depending on the grade level, of the basic elements of fiction. This is something that's just quick in the beginning, and then we go into more uh, deeper dives as the semester goes on. And the reason I do that at the beginning is because they're all reading different books. And let's say someone is reading Salt to the Sea, where setting is really, really important, and and also point of view and perspective. And I don't do lessons on that until October and they're reading this in September. By doing a quick introduction to all the elements of fiction at the beginning, your students will have that basic language and that starting place to write about and just to discuss their books. <clears throat> so this is an example of what I have in my membership, my introductory lessons that cover not all the elements of fiction, but most of the main ones that students are going to come, come across in their reading. And again, these lessons are quick and short, and I might only spend a week or two on this, um, just as my students are easing into the process of learning how workshop runs and how we're going to set goals. And I'm also doing um, mini lessons on author use of language at the same time. So let's go back to my strategy where we're targeting skills, using mentor texts, and giving students practice applying those skills. I'm going to take one of my introductory lessons and walk you through that. So my lesson on identifying setting, these are the skills I want to target, that students know what the setting is and how the writers are using language to create the sense of time and place. I also want them to be able to cite strong and thorough textual evidence to support any analysis that they do. We might be not be doing this in the first week or two, but eventually they're going to get there with these lessons. So I choose short passages where setting is significant so I can model what it looks like when an author does an effective job of creating setting. And then students get lots of opportunity to apply the skill with other mentor texts and their own novels and even in their own writing. So I have a whole lesson plan. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, just kind of an overview. We start with a discussion of what setting is and that it's not just time and place, but it's also the social context. And I do a little bit more discussion about what social context means. So for example, if your book is about a teenage girl struggle for identity or to be independent, sorry, um, if it's set in London in the 1800s versus New York City in 1965 or, 19, or 2020, it's going to make a big difference. So the social context and the time and place affects the story. After my mini lesson, I give them a short passage to read. And in this case, it's from where the crawdads sing. And it, it's only two paragraphs long. And I ask the students to read it and highlight how the author used, their lang used her language to create the sense of time and place. After they've had time to do that, I go back to my slideshow and I highlight some places where I know she was using language for effect. In this case, she's personifying elements of the setting to show the effect that the setting has on the narrator. 
Then we do it again with another short um, passage from Stranger in the Woods, which is a nonfiction piece. And just a little sidebar here, <clears throat> when you use these short passages, it's also a great opportunity to do a book talk. So you don't have to separate book talk mini lesson, it can all be embedded, right? So again, they're given this passage, they have to highlight how the author uses language to evoke a sense of setting. And then my slideshow again, has things highlighted to show them the imagery and the simile and whatnot that the author uses to create the setting. Then after the mini lesson, we read, I usually almost always do the mini lesson first, so they can be looking for what I'm teaching them about in the reading. Sometimes we just read for fun. Don't get me wrong. We might even spend half a class reading after we built up the stamina. But in the days where I'm focusing on skills, I do the mini lesson first. Then they read and they look for evidence of how the author creates setting in their novel. Now, they might not be in a section where that happens um, when they're reading, but they can you know, rely on what they've read about already. So as they're reading, they're looking for places where the author uses language to create setting. When they're finished, they can either do a short response in their notebooks or turn and talk with a partner to show them, I might say, okay, find one place where your author used imagery or figurative language to create setting. They turn, they share, it's very quick. It doesn't have to be a long drawn out process. If I want them to write um, more analytically, I can give them assignment where I ask them to discuss the time and place in their novel whether or not it's important, whether social context is important and whatnot. And I ask them to use references and specific details or quotes from the test. And of course, there's an assessment checklist for them to look at. Later, I will also have them practice what they learned in their own writing. And this could be just like an in-class skill building assignment or a major assignment. Early in the year, I do a lot of just in-class skill building. And here's an example. We're talking about setting and how a person's perspective might affect how they feel in the setting. So in this case, it's someone who's not a big fan of math class, right? And I show them how I use language to um, create that effect. So there are math class staring at the clock, the teacher's writing hieroglyphics, um, refers to the foreign language that is math. And I feel the walls of the classroom tight, tighten around me. The clock makes this painful march toward the bell. So it's clear math place is not a great place for the writer of this paragraph. I have them pick a, a setting that evokes a strong feeling in them, whether it's something they like, they dislike, they're afraid of, they're happy in, whatever the case might be. And then <clears throat> I have them rewrite it to change the feeling that's evoked by the setting. So in this case, the person loves math and they're so excited. The numbers are lining up, sharing their secrets. Um, and again, it's this describing the same setting, but the person's perspective and language choice changes it. This is a, an assignment my students always enjoy doing. You can also do this as a group activity. Um, I like to mix and match the independent activities where they practice their skills with group ones. Early in the year, I tend to do more group ones because it's more engaging, more ideas, and students who aren't good at coming up with ideas can learn from those who are. Let's look at another example that I do with point of view and perspective. So in this case, we're talking about reliable narrators. I do my lesson. The students get a mentor text. I go back to the lesson. We look at what they, what they identified. And then we do another mentor text. These are short. So you get to do the I, I do, we do, you do um, scenario because they're short and they don't take a lot of time, right? So we look at another excerpt from Speak by Laurie House Anderson. And then when they're reading, I'm asking students to consider this question. Is the narrator of your novel reliable or not? And how do you know? And then they can do another turn and talk or a short journal entry. Another thing that I do is these while reading handouts. So if I know during the week we are focusing on point of view, I will give one, them one of these handouts at the beginning of the week and then they can work on them as they're reading during the week. So early in the semester, I might just give them this simple one where they're identifying the point of view. And then later on, they might um, dig into whether or not their narrator is reliable or unreliable. And again, these are things you can stick in at any time of the year 
at the beginning, I do the introductory ones, and then I do the deeper dives later on, depending on what works. Um, my um, membership provides you with all kinds of very detailed lessons of how you can do this. Um, it's got all the lesson plans, the activities, the assessments, the rubrics that you need to effectively roll this out for your students. Um, and again, I like to have a mix of independent and collaborative activities so students can learn from each other, but they also have to do their own thing, right? And every lesson that we do gets turned around so how they can, or gets turned around so they have to look for how it happens in their novel. So if I'm doing a lesson on how authors create narrative voice, then they have to find examples of it in their own novel. And again, not with everything, but with some things, I have them do an analytical paragraph on um, the literary element that we're looking at. The, the thing about this is that they're all reading different novels and each one might have a different um, emphasis. So in one novel point of view and perspective might be super important and setting is not and vice versa. So I like to give my students choice that after we've done these lessons, now you have to write an analytical paragraph and we do some practice and they can pick the literary element that's most important. So Sean might write an analytical paragraph on setting for his novel and Jalissa might write an analytical paragraph on point of view, right? The point is, is that their paragraph is illustrating their skills, right? That they can write a proper paragraph, that they can select good evidence and cite and embed the quotations and that it's analysis and not plot summary. So whether they're writing about point of view or setting or character, they can demonstrate those skills for you. You can also assess your students via conferences and I highly recommend conferencing. Not only is it a way to get, know, get to know your students, it's also a very effective way to assess because it's harder for them to fudge it in a conference than it is in, writ in written format where they can get stuff off the internet or get chat GPT to write it for them. It's also really good for relationship building. So in my membership and on TPT, you can get my reading conference guides and I give them to the students ahead of time so they can prepare. They know the types of questions that we're gonna talk about and that makes the conferences go much more quickly. If Sarah sits down in front of me and she clearly hasn't prepared, if it's the beginning of the year, I'll say, Sarah, get back to your seat, get ready, and we'll do this again tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to go on and show you some more examples, but if any time you want to ask me questions, this is not live, so you can send me an email and I will answer within the next 12 to 24 hours. Let's go back to the lesson. So once again, these are the three checks that you want to do whenever you are trying to teach your students the skills and they're all reading different texts. And you're going to try to use strategies and activities that engage them, even when they're reading something different and you want a seamless plan to get your grammar and writing instruction in there. So we're going to look at grammar right now. Um, you can do your targeted mini lessons and worksheets, which still have their time and place, but I also like to embed the grammar instruction into things that the students are reading. So they see that grammar is a tool for writing and not just something they have to check off during the editing process or to use to complete a worksheet. So when I do my comma lessons, we do a whole thing on how common, commas are used to develop ideas, to, to, to create a more full um, paragraph or story or whatever that you're doing because they're used when the author um, uses more detail to show and they can be used to create voice and tone as well. So, and also for creating variety and sentence structure. So that's kind of the focus when I'm doing comma instruction, not just, you need to stick a comma in there. Students will get hand corresponding handouts that go with all the skills that I'm teaching them. And then of course they get their mentor texts. In this case, each passage is focusing on a setting. So we're reaching back into those lessons on setting and also looking at how they're using commas to add more variety and detail to describe this setting. So again, they're going to highlight or underline places where, where the author is actually doing that. And then they get their time 
to sit and work independently usually only takes a couple minutes because it's a short paragraph to look for places where commas are used to add more detail. Then we go back to my mini lesson and I highlight places. First, I ask them, okay, everybody, where did you find a place where a comma was used to add more showing detail? And then I get them to tell me before I show them, right? This is just my screen that I show after I've had the students give me their information. Another lesson I do is on how commas, m dashes, and ellipses are used for creating voice. Again, start with a short little lesson, give them their mentor text that they highlight and underline places where the commas and their friends, the m dash and ellipsis are used to create voice. They get their time to work on it. We go back, we discuss it, discuss the effect of the ellipsis versus the m dash and so forth. After these mini lessons, what do we do? Students read their novels. They note places where commas are used, why the authors are using them, if there are m dashes and ellipses in there, bonus. They turn and share a sentence or two after they're reading with a partner um, to show where and why these punctuation marks were used. After we're done, we might do a writing exercise where students go back and look through their own writing, whether it's a notebook piece or a longer piece of writing or even something they passed in for assessment and look for places where they can add comments that require commas, dashes, ellipsis to create tone and voice. And this says comments because it's connected to a certain assignment that we were doing, I think. I can dive even more deeply into this, or I can come back and revisit the idea later in the semester because you know that students need reinforcement. They don't, it's not one and done with most of them, right? Um, in this case, we are again still working on comma usage and also creating voice. I use um, two novels to do this assignment. One is um, You Should See Me in a Crown and the other is Don't Read the Comments. Again, a reminder, when you do lessons like this, your book talking is embedded into your lesson plan, right? So I also try to find hooks, things that the students are going to find relative and interesting. And in this case, in uh, You Should See Me in a Crown, one big thing is the proposal. So we start with, what is it? What do you think of it? I show them this nonfiction piece. It's an article where they're discussing the concept of proposals. And you can see there's also opportunity in here for me to look at the M dash um, and how it's used in the writer's writing. Um, they get their mentor texts and they have to find four different ways that Johnson uses commas in the passage. And then after they do it, we go back. I ask first, where did you find them? I'm also like, as they're doing it, I'm walking around and, and seeing what people have identified. So I might say, okay, uh, Sherry, did you find any interrupters in there? Or Marcus, did you find any non-essential clauses? I don't stand there and say, here's blah, 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 because that's boring. These slides are just there more for guide for the teacher so you know it's there and so the students can see them when you're done. So this passage has all kinds of different ways that commas are used. There's the interrupter and non-essential clause, interchangeable adjectives, positives, items in the series, more non-essential phrases, m dash for emphasis, nan of address. I asked them, is this a nan of address or an appositive? So you can see it's a really good passage to show all the different ways the commas can be used. Here's another one. And it gives me the opportunity to talk about why it's used the way that it is and that it's um, a stylistic choice rather than a particular grammar rule. We also, as we're reading this, we're not just talking about commas, we're talking about tone and voice and how it all works together. So it's all very much embedded. So after we do this, we do a writing assignment where students have to pick a tradition that is part of their school, home, or town, and something that they either really like, they love the tradition, or like the girl, the narrator in the, in the novel, you find ridiculous, ridiculously, obnoxiously annoying. They really like that one. So they brainstorm, they choose one of their ideas, and they use the passage I gave them as a model or not, they don't have to, to write a draft that explores an aspect of this tradition. And the kicker here is they also have to use some commas to add variety, detail, and voice to their writing. So you can see how I targeted the skills of using a comma properly 
and using language to create tone and voice, as well as the comma. I gave them multiple mentor texts to look at. None of them are long, so these lessons don't take long. And then they had several opportunities to apply the skill with their text, because of course they're looking at it in their novel as well. We don't need to go through that again. So you might be thinking, cool, Jackie, I like the strategy. I can see how it works, but like, where do I find the mentor text? And more importantly, where do I find the time to do so? So I can help you, as you know, um, I give away a lot of free stuff, but I also have things that you can purchase to um, help your reading workshop or independent reading program. So we're going to come out of here for a second and we're going to go into my TBT store and I've got my reading workshop bundle. And I'm just going to hopefully load this. I'm at the cottage and the internet is a little slow. Um, I just want to give you an overview of what you can find in here. This makes it bigger. No. Okay. So it's got a reader's workshop planner that has all kinds of forms and strategies and tips and planning guides and ideas for how to do conferences that's in there. Then there is also some uh, lesson plans that you can use to um, pull together all the resources in the workshop or in the, the bundle. It doesn't have lesson plans for everything, but just they're kind of the ones to get you started. And a lot of the, the uh, there's lesson plans embedded into some of the products as well. Um, there are stations for learning to respond to text. I'm not going to let's go over this way because it's taking too much time. There are also um, mini lessons for the basic literary elements like setting conflict perspective, opening lines. There are lessons on how authors create character and how to uh, explore and understand theme, active and close reading lessons. My while you were reading um, forms are in here and then there's uh, conference. Oh, there's sorry. There's learning stations and there are task cards for talking about books, writing prompts, uh, readers notebook, conferencing guides and posters. Now that is my original reading workshop bundle. I created a mega bundle yesterday and I added in here more mini lessons. So you've got, um, Suspension, suspense and tension, symbolism motif and character arcs, archetypes and journeys. So it's got more lessons that will allow you to teach. And all of these things come with embedded short mentor texts. So I also have um, my membership and let's go back here. I have it all ready to go. When you go into the membership, you are going to find a video that shows you everything that is in there. And we'll just take a quick look at that right now. Okay, so that's just the introductory, I gotta get out of here, the introductory um, video that you can get to help you navigate the site when you go in. 
Um, if you are new to workshop, there's a section in there um, about how to set up your classroom library, how to map out your workshop and what it looks like in a real classroom. You also get um, tips on how to target those skills and your standards and to make a plan for it and um, information on the things that you need to have and how to deliver a mini lesson and whatnot. And forgive this, this is my slow internet. Um, again, like I said, it's got what workshop looks in room 213. And I give you some variations of how I would roll out my workshop in a 75 minute class. And then I have some options for if it's a 40 minute class. Everybody's timing is different, but you know, you get the idea. In the introductory section, there are a lot of lessons on what you should do when you start. So how you establish your expectations, teaching your students about active reading, close reading, like I went through at the beginning of this video, and how to use the stations to teach students what you expect, what your standard is for when they respond to text. You can also, if you're going to use read, the reading notebook, it shows you how to set that up. There's some posters that you can use to put up in your classroom. Um, that focus on creating character, theme, and things like that. There's also a frequently asked questions section. If I don't answer your questions, you can email me and I'll add that to this section. We talked about the introductory lessons. There's the establishing routines and procedures that I already talked about. And then there are also, um, that's twice, hooks and bell ringers that you can use at any time during the year. And there's a new section of back to school activities where I've um, linked it to starting a reading workshop. So students will work together to create the story of their class or to um, kind of set some goals for themselves with openings and closings. So you're melding that getting to know you climate building um, activities that you do at the beginning of the school year with starting dipping your feet into teaching them about the elements of fiction. There's also a section in the membership called reading and analysis. So you do your introductory lessons and then you do your reading and analysis. Um, sorry, you're doing your reading and analysis all the time, but this is when you want to get into more deeply into things. The first part of this section also has uh, some tips and strategies for um, running a book club as well as planning a novel study. That's actually a whole course, which I'll show you here in a second. And there's a mentor tech text index that I try to keep updated. So you can go in and like, you're looking for something for setting, you're looking for something for suspense. You can, you can find where the mentor texts are and it links back to the membership so you can easily find them. Uh, this is um, just a little taste of what you get for your book club. Um, all of these are linked to the things that you need to run the book club with your students and the resources are here. So there's quite a lot of stuff in there that you can use to run to do the book club thing with your students. Uh, for example, you might be doing literary conversation books. This is something I did with my students. So we, for each text we were doing, I had it organized with these baskets and they would use the conversation books and they would take turns doing that. It's all explained in this product. I also give you a calendar of how I ran it, just so you can kind of gauge how that actually worked. The planning a novel study course is completely free. You just have to uh, put your information in and it takes you to the course and it walks you through um, the process you can go through if you do want to do a full class novel or a play. And it helps you with the planning and prep, how to structure your class, activities and assessments that you can use. And you can see, for example, over here, there's a bunch of downloads that you can access where there's actually activities you can use with your students. In the membership, there's also um, a lot of like sections where we, we meld reading and writing together. And there's detailed lesson plans on that. So you already did your, your introductory lessons on, on setting back in the first part of the school year. And then you decide you want to take a deeper dive into it. Um, I've got detailed lesson plans that explain how you can do that with the mentor text built in with um, the This Week in Reading or while you're reading uh, handouts that take a deeper look at setting and not just the initial cursory look. Again, there, it comes with all kinds of mentor texts. In this case, we've got a couple of graphic novels, The Secret Path, and um, what's this one called? 
March <laughs> and Firekeeper's Daughter. So again, it's not the whole text. You don't need the text. I provide you with short passages from the text that you can use. Again, you can book talk, you can work on the skill, target the skill of how setting is developed in each one. And then of course, there's the reading conference guide to help you assess your students on it and other activities and assessments that you can do. So in this case, they're tracking setting in their own novel. And in this case, they are creating their own as well as discussing um, how the setting plays out in their novel with their classmates, which with people who are reading a different text. All kinds of graphic organizers, assessments, rubrics, ideas for group work. You'll get that with almost every um, lesson plan that's in the membership. Let's take a look at taking a deeper dive into symbols and motifs. Again, you get your detailed lesson plans, you have mentor texts, and I try to choose ones that are at a variety of reading levels. So that we have the jacket for the younger students. The necklace could probably be read by anybody and Saturday climbing is more for older students. Each one goes through the process of teaching students how to look for symbols and motifs in their reading. You get your This Week in Reading workshop format or um, graphic organizers and assessment tools. And then of course, there's always some sort of fun collaborative collaborative activity that the students can use to work on this together. One of my favorite sections in the membership is the themes and genres one. And it's one where you can go to find um, lessons where you're really seamlessly embedding reading and writing, grammar, all of those things. Um, I went through my comma one, which is an example of lesson plans where you're looking at targeted skills in terms of writing, but the students are also reading and analyzing at the same time. And again, you get all of the, the lesson plans linked to the handouts that you need for your students, the slideshows that you need, the rubrics, mentor texts, all of those things. And this is the example from you should see me in a crown and don't read the comments. Again, you get all of the mentor texts. Uh, one I created most recently, for obvious reasons, is one uh, reading and writing unit where you take a look at artificial intelligence and ChatGPT. It starts with a discussion of what artificial intelligence is, what are the pros and cons of technology. There are two short stories that were written in the 1950s where they more or less predicted AI and students are going to read those first and see what those authors were, were saying about it. So you get like a longer mentor text because it's a short story. And it's an opportunity for students to discuss a longer text together. And you can also be looking, if you want to, at particular elements of a short story or the way the elements of fiction, or you can just use it to discuss artificial intelligence. You'll get all the slideshows again that you need. Um, then there's also an activity in here where students are grouped and they're all given a different um, nonfiction piece that explores the idea of artificial intelligence and they're going to report back to the group and have a big group discussion about whether this is a good thing or not. And there are final assessments you can choose from, whether it's a final reflection, a letter to another student or a teacher about how to deal with AI, or just a formal response and everything that they've done. And if for the formal response, there are samples that you can show them so they can see what a good response looks like. I also have my dystopian fiction bundle, similar ideas. You get your detailed lesson plans, you get your This Week in Reading workshop, you have group activities, assessments, and of course, mentor texts. Um, in this case, we've got nonfiction texts, dystopian short stories, and also have in this one some stations where they can learn the characteristics of dystopian fiction. There's also a section in the membership on embedding grammar. I need a drink here. Um, in the first part of the module, there are some videos that show you how to use the concept of mini lessons and mentor sentences to teach grammar, how to embed it in your instruction and how to assess it, how to use conferences and peer editing to build your students' grammar skills. Um, there's a whole section on how to use a quickie conference to quickly assess how your students are doing so it doesn't always have to take up too much time. And then there are some of these 
um, reading the power of the comma is a, an embedded reading and writing thing, but there are also some targeted mini lessons and activities for these air gram grammatical errors. They come with the slideshows that you can use to teach the targeted lessons. Um, there are grammar stations where they can practice their skills. And then there are opportunities to um, use what they learn in their own writing. In this case, we're looking at how fragments can possibly be used for effect. Not possibly, probably, but they have to know the difference, right? In this case, it's used for emphasis and to add more detail. Always we're linking it back to their own reading. Okay, so that's how the independent reading gets melded into this. So you give your lesson and get them to look for something as they read. Okay, in this case, we're looking to see if they can find fragments that are used for effect. I'm going to remind you, students don't always have to be looking for something when they're reading. Sometimes you're just reading for fun, but this is how you tie it to the skill building. The membership also has resources for poetry. In this case, this is a lesson on Taylor Swift's anti-hero. Does a double whammy thing because not only are you looking at poetry, but learning about the concept of the anti-hero. And um, students um, do some analysis. They can do the, uh, some creative writing. This is one of my favorite poetry ones. It's about odes to the everyday. So students learn about what odes are. They learn about Pablo Narada. And then we look at some of his odes to the everyday. And as we're doing that, we're also looking at the language he uses in his poems. We also look at one by Marcus Jackson. And then of course, students write their own ode. To tie it back to their novel, I have them pick a character in their novel and get them to brainstorm, like if they were to write an ode to the everyday, what object or thing would this character write about? And then they actually write the ode. And in doing so, they're showing me what they learned about poetry, but also they have to illustrate what they know about the character in order to pick something important from the character. Okay, so that is the poetry section of the membership. Let's go in and look at the other things that are in here. The last two modules, one is called skill building, and you'll go here if you're looking for particular um, activities, whether they be independent or collaborative, where students are working on things like literary analysis, um, critical thinking. I've got a section here for building skills for persuasion and argument. And then I've got a bunch of learning stations that you can use. So for example, if you're working on narrative writing, you could use those. There's descriptive writing stations, ones that you can use for independent reading where students will go around um, to each station and they focus on, let's say, you've got a station for setting and they have to write about setting in their novel and a station for um, point of view. And there can also be a station for conferencing. So it's a really cool way to keep students busy while you're conferencing and working on something else. Um, there's the essay revision stations, stations for analyzing text, which you can use again for any um, text that you're using, and poetry analysis stations as well. And in the grammar section, of course, there are uh, all my grammar station, grammar stations as well. I'm getting tired of talking here. Um, there's also this section here. Um, one of the things that um, is more difficult with independent reading is getting students to talk about books because they can't talk about this thing that happened in chapter three of, of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so I've got task, task cards for talking about books that keep students focused on a particular topic in ways that their novels might link. And the collaborative placemats are also a similar idea, just a different format that students find pretty engaging because it, it kind of keeps them focused and more directed in their discussion. So those are pretty cool. All of these things you find like in the download section of the membership. So you go into the active learning exercises and to the down, download section and you grab your, your lesson plans or your assessments. So let's go to assessment now. Um, in this section, you'll find ideas for assessments in reading workshop and a whole bunch of stuff on conferencing. Uh, those conferencing guides that you saw in the video are all here and they're all kind of linked to the other lessons in the membership. Um, there, there are also scripts. And that's one thing people were asking me for, like, what does a conferencing conference actually sound like. So I don't have the video because that's complicated getting the permission from the student and the parent, but I actually sat down 
and typed up a variety of scripts for like your keen student, a student where you're trying to pull out more information, a student who didn't read the book. So you're going to see a variety of, of scenarios that you'll come across when you're doing your conferencing and you'll see how I handled it um, in the conference with the student. And all of these are, they're not made up. They're based on my own experiences. Um, there's also writing conference guides um, and the reader's notebooks. If you want to use those a bunch of writing prompts that connect to independent reading and a multi genre project, which is one of my favorite final assessments for a reading workshop. So that is all I got for you today. If you have questions about anything from the format that I taught you about at the beginning of the workshop or um, questions about my Reader's work Workshop bundles on Teachers Pay Teachers or the membership, please fire me a question. Even if it's a question about strategy and how would you do how you would do something in your classroom, I would love to help you. And you can also always check out my blog because I share lots of strategies and ideas and freebies there too. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again sometime.